so um i'm just recording there now just to let you know so um hi everyone my name is jack i'm the chairperson of the pharmacy society this year and you're all very welcome to the second night of the covid conference just before we begin i'd ask you all to have a read of the blue box so as a ucc endorsed event it's important that we are all responsible and that we make sure that we create an informative and enjoyable environment so um i'd also just like to point out point out that segments of tonight will be recorded so if you don't want to be seen in the recording make sure to have your camera off and and all of that so so just as a bit of background, this is a week-long collaboration between five societies here in UCC to present the unfolding pandemic from a different perspective every night. So last night was the Science Society's night that was outstanding and I'm sure that tonight will live up to the bar that's been set. We've got three outstanding speakers and I'd just like to thank all of them for coming here tonight. And I'd also like to thank our two education officers, Rona and Kira for organising our speakers. So I'll now hand you over to Brona to present our first speaker. Thanks very much for that, Jack. I hope all my audio sounds okay and everything. So as well as this, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the night. So if you have any questions, please do post them into the Zoom chat. So as Jack said, I'm Brona and I'm one of the education officers here on Farmstock as well. So to start off the night, we have our first speaker, UCC's own Dr. Anne Moore. So Dr. Moore is a senior lecturer and principal investigator in the School of Biochemistry and Cell Biology. So she graduated from UCC with a D degree in biochemistry, then went on to complete a PhD in HIV vaccine immunology. So since then, Dr. Moore has worked on vaccines for HIV, TB, malaria and Ebola. So our current research areas involved the development of innovative vaccines and immunotherapies, such as microneedle vaccine delivery. Since the outbreak of the COVID-19 pandemic, Dr. Moore has been working on the development of a COVID-19 vaccine, which is now moving to early phase clinical trials with Vaxart. So without further ado, I am delighted to introduce Dr. Anne Moore, who will be speaking to us on development of a COVID-19 vaccine. Great. Thank you very much, Brona, and thanks for the invitation to speak here. I'm um, just wondering how we go to share the screen. Uh, are we doing that? Oh yeah, share screen. Okay. Uh, here we go. Right, hopefully you can see that. I'll just... Uh, Get rid of you there. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect there. We can see that. Okay. okay, so thanks very much. As I said, I'll try and keep this to time. I'm even going to set a timer this time. And uh, but I'll talk to you a bit about the development of a, a COVID-19 vaccine and a little bit about all the work that's gone into preparing a, um, a, a pandemic vaccine. So, uh, this is moving on. Okay, there we go. Okay, so if we think about it in the 21st uh, century to date, some of you may not have been born in the 20, you know, very small in the 21st century, but the first thing that happened to us was 9 11. And that led to a lot of uh, interest in, in bioterrorism uh, vaccines and bioterrorism agents that could be coming by people that were seen as, as unfriendly uh, uh, sources. And it did lead to some developments in, in vaccines, um, but not quite as much as, as, as we should. The first kind of uh, big scare of the 21st century was SARS, or the original SARS coronavirus, which happened around 2001, 2002. Now SARS is a very, um, leads to a lot of pathology, uh, fairly high level of mortality as well um, and it isn't uh, it's infectious but it, it is you can contain it it's very high levels of disease severe disease and not uh, as infectious as the coronavirus that we have now uh, the big kind of pandemic that we all thought and planned to happen was um, was the uh, flu uh, swine flu uh, pandemic in 2009 and even though we prepared for it for about 10, 15 years, we were still slow at getting a vaccine uh, out to, to use it. And we learned a lot of lessons from, from that particular um, uh, pandemic. 
More recently, we've had epidemics such as, as uh, Ebola in West Africa in 2014, and more recently in the Democratic Republic of Congo. And again, the reaction, I'll come back to this later on, the, the, the vaccine uh, reaction to that was far too slow to, compared to, to what we should have had. And the whole global response to that Ebola outbreak was, was far too slow, uh, which led to enormous amount of mortality. Ebola has a very, very high level of mortality. Uh, people get sick very quickly and are laid low very quickly. So that does, to some extent, to a very limited extent, um, uh, limit the spread of disease compared to what we see now with, with SARS coronavirus 2. MERS is the, is the second uh, coronavirus that, that has emerged uh, this century, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. It was originally uh, uh, transmitted from camels to camel uh, uh, workers, camel farmers, um, and now it's spread from human to human transmission. And uh, finally, Zika virus, uh, which is, is, is spread by insects, was the last big scare that we had so far of the 20th century, or the 21st century, before the current coronavirus outbreak. And Zika, both, uh, for, for many of these diseases, such as Ebola and Zika, and SARS, uh, we had a scare, we had a panic uh, for SARS and for Zika, then the interest in developing a vaccine went right down. So we, do, we don't have vaccines to either of these two diseases. For MERS, uh, we are developing a vaccine at the moment. And Ebola, we have actually managed to, to develop uh, two, if not three vaccines. So how do we prepare for the unknown? The first thing is that we need to do a lot of basic research, uh, both in the immunology and virology expertise uh, areas and understand uh, to, to really get that expertise up to scratch so that we can respond to something new. If, it's, if we have enough expertise, then we, it, it won't be as new as, uh, as we think it is. We need to monitor for emerging infectious diseases. Again, a lot of virology, a lot of zoology, a lot of epidemiology to keep track of, of what is emerging out of uh, the environment, out of uh, crowded spaces. Um, and a lot of work by WHO and OIE to see what's transmitting across from, from animal species into, into humans. Community engagement was something that was really learned in the Ebola outbreak in 2014. We can't just go into places as scientists and as medics and health professionals and uh, kind of um, implement our scientific or medical response to that. We need to work with communities and being able to uh, explain what the disease is and, and, and our approaches to, to solving it and why everybody's dressed up in white suits is an incredibly important um, area that needs to be looked at as well. So, and as well as that behaviour science is ensure that the pharmacists uh, understand and, and, and are learning about in, in college as well. And anthropology and social science was incredibly important in uh, developing an, an effective Ebola uh, response in 2014. And then these areas, build vaccine platforms, build stockpiles, ensure vaccine access, is really where our, our, my interest is in being able to have a vaccine that you can quickly kind of plug and play the new emerging disease into and I'll talk a little bit more about that. Also stockpiles, being able to, to, to keep vaccines on the shelf for long periods of time and I, I'll touch a little bit on, on vaccine access but, but uh, I don't think time allows us to talk too much about it. So I just want to touch briefly on um, uh, immunity. I'm sure a lot of you will realise that I could spend at least 20 credits of your degree programme talking about immunology and I'll try not to do that. This is a really good article that was published in the Atlantic in August which is really very self-effacing by immunologists. It is, immunology is where intuition goes to die. We love to have very different names for very different systems but really if we think of the immune system as it's all about defence. We have to have the um, the ability to look out for to see what's being what's attacking the body and then we have to appropriate the, the we have to mount the most appropriate response to that infection depending on whether it's a virus or a bacteria whether it's going into the lung or it's going through the skin or it's going into the blood it's got to be a very coordinated response if it isn't as we've seen with SARS-CoV-2 we can have this over inflammation or we can have people the virus overcoming the immune system very quickly and to do that, there are a lot of cells uh, and signals such as cytokines and chemokines that are important in, in driving that response. And then if you want to overcome that virus of bacterial or parasite infection, it has to be the right cells have to get to the right place at the right time and do the right thing. I'm not going to talk about this in detail. I'm just going to mention two different populations, two types of, of cells that are important in generating a memory immune response. 
One is, uh, are, are these whole population of T cells. And you can sort of break these down into two populations are killer T cells, which are CD8 positive cytotoxic T cells. They will go in, if a, if a cell is infected with virus, it will go in and kill that cell. And thereby, by, by killing off that cell, you prevent the infection from disseminating to other cells. We also have whole other populations of CD4 positive T cells that are very important in coordinating the response and making sure that you've the right type of response that's appropriate to, to kill off that pathogen. The other main population of, of cells that we have that are in the adaptive response are B cells. And B cells are the cells that produce antibodies. And I'm sure you've all heard a lot about antibodies in the last six months. Once an, a B cell, a naive B cell recognizes uh, antigen, which is your virus protein, it will do this generally in what are called germinal centers in, in the lymph node, and it'll start proliferating and changing and differentiating. And one population that it will change into are these what are called plasma cells that ironically live in the bone marrow, not the plasma. And these cells are really important in constantly pumping out antibody that are very, that have, uh, that the B cell has defined and differentiated to produce very, very specifically to a specific virus antigen. And we also have, and this is what produces your antibodies that keeps that, that antibody level in your serum quite high. And then we also have memory B cells as well that remain in tissues ready to respond again. We have different types of antibodies that are produced by B cells. The first one that's produced is IgM, which is this uh, pentameric uh, antibody that um, is low affinity. It's kind of a knee jerk reaction by B cells. It works, it does that kind of initial mopping up of, of uh, infection. But really, we want to get to these for, for virus infections, we really want to get to these populations, these antibodies here. IgG, which is in the serum, it can be in the lower respiratory tract, and then uh, IgA, which when it's on its own, so this molecule here can be found in the blood, but when it's dimeric, it's, it's secreted out into the mucosa, and that's a real first level of defense uh, against, uh, against a mucosal invading pathogens. So you can have, uh, when the virus starts increasing, we start having an immune response against it, and um, killing off that virus, and you see, our, you see the number of T cells, and you also see the number of B cells increasing and really begin to respond and proliferate against that uh, virus invasion. As immunologists, we love looking at the different subpopulations that are present. I'm not going to go into them in too much detail. But once we get rid of the virus, we need to actually get rid of a huge number of those cells, but we want to maintain memory. We want to be able to start from a higher place than we were before, similar to when you're learning in a university degrees, you don't want to start from scratch every year. You want to keep building on what you've learned already. So you don't want to go back to, to zero. So memory is hugely important in the immune response so that you can respond more effectively and more, more uh, and faster and higher the second time that you see that response. So this is what we're seeing here, which is an example of, of antibody responses. So the first time you see the infection, you have an IgM, IgG response for, for, for antibodies and you clear the response. The second time you want it to be higher, faster and stronger. So with that, uh, so we want antibodies and we want T cells, we want an effective immune response against uh, this virus here, which is our, our, our SARS coronavirus 2. And you can see this is, these are primary bronchial epithelial cells and you can see them absolutely peppered with uh, the SARS CoV-2 uh, uh, virus here. And what we know about the coronavirus is that um, it's a fairly big uh, genome and it has uh, open reading frames and then these structural um, uh, proteins here. And this protein here, spike, is the one that's on the outside of our, our virus. And I'm sure you've heard a lot about spike. And this protein, and I'll talk a fair bit about it, is that it will, um, this is responsible for binding on to ACE2 receptor, which is on the cell that it's, it's going to infect. and um, pushing, the, allowing the virus to bind and then insert its nucleic acids into, into the cell. We also have other structural proteins such as uh, envelope matrix and this nucleocapsid down here, which wraps around the, the RNA and nucleocapsid is present at very, very high levels. I think there's, I can't remember, is it about three or 10 times more nucleocapsid per virus particle compared to spike. Okay, so what do we know about coronavirus infection overall? Where are we coming from with knowing what could happen with a SARS-CoV-2 infection? There was a really amazing facility in Salisbury in England called the Common Cold Research Unit, which did what it says in the tin, um, which looked a lot at what happens, why, how do people have immune responses against common colds? 
And to do that, what you can do is um, actually deliberately infect people in what we call now a, a controlled human infection model. I mean, you can do this with influenza, you can do it with other like uh, seasonal coronaviruses that cause uh, colds, and then you can look at the immune response in these individuals. And what we know from this research back in the uh, late 80s and early 90s is that you don't have a durable immune response to the common cold, which makes sense. We're always getting common colds. Every year we come down with a cold. We don't have an immune response that protects us against, uh, against that. So it's not durable so that the virus, it doesn't mutate a lot, but it does have mechanisms whereby it can bypass that uh, 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 protective durable immune response. You keep being reinfected by those, those uh, common uh, coronaviruses. When it comes to other coronaviruses, such as um, SARS and MERS, we know that the, the durability of immunity, both antibodies and T cells, is, is associates with the severity of infection. So if you have a very severe disease, and if it's SARS or MERS, that severe disease will, if you're still alive, will have nearly killed you, um, you do have very uh, durable and high immune response. You've got good memory to those two viruses. We don't know if that will protect you again because we've never actually challenged people with SARS or MERS quite, quite rightly so, but we don't know, we just know that that response is present in individuals. With SARS-CoV-2, we know that antibodies, IgG, against the receptor binding domain part of the spike protein, the receptor binding domain is part binds to ACE2 receptor, correlates, every study will show that the, the ELISA titers, IgG titers, correlate very nicely with neutralize, neutralizing antibody titers. And these neutralizing titers are the really functional antibodies that are needed to actually stop the, um, the uh, virus infecting a cell. But we also have lots of antibody responses to the other antigens as well. I and mean, you get very, very high antibody responses to nucleocapsid, which is one um, factor that can be used in, in antibody testing is to, to look to see if, if they're nucleocapsid there. But none of these responses will be neutralizing. So we know that it's uh, against spike. If you've neutralizing antibodies against spike, you should have a better uh, ability to stop virus infecting, um, in, infecting cells. You also have very good T cell responses, I won't go into this in, in any depth, but one thing that we know is that you have um, uninfected individuals also have T cells that will recognize SARS-CoV-2 uh, antigens. And there's a lot of debate at the moment as to what they're doing, if they're protective, we just don't know uh, yet. Okay, so overall if we look at coronaviruses, this is our common cold kind of strategies. It's an upper respiratory tract infection. It gives you mild cold symptoms, even though we probably don't feel like that when we have a cold, um, and you get rapidly waning uh, immunity. Whereas with uh, MERS and SARS, it's a lower respiratory infection. Um, it can cause very, it generally causes severe pneumonia, um, and but you do get long-lived uh, immune responses. Whereas SARS-CoV-2 is the worst of both worlds. It, you have upper respiratory um, replication, lower respiratory replication transmission very easily because it's upper respiratory and severe disease when it's, when it's lower respiratory. We don't know yet about the duration of immunity. There's a lot we don't know about immune responses to, to SARS-CoV-2. There's a lot we can infer based on what we know about other coronaviruses, but we just don't know yet. I just want to highlight here really quickly that SARS-CoV-2 is not influenza. I know, I'm sure none of you believe Donald Trump, which is good, but at the same time, there's a lot of differences about the immunology of SARS-CoV-2 to influenza. Influenza is constantly mutating to, up to, to um, uh, avoid the pre-existing immunity, these pre-existing antibody responses that exist to these, these uh, surface antigens that are on influenza. SARS-CoV-2 does not mutate. It's very, there, are minor, there are some mutations, but it's not mutating because of the, the pressure being put on it by immunity. If anything, um, SARS-CoV-2 is more similar to RSV, which is respiratory syncytial virus, um, which is uh, a, again, this virus that most of us will get most years, and we're laid a little bit low by it, but it doesn't really affect us. Whereas it really does affect um, uh, newborn infants and particularly uh, preterm uh, pre babies, as well as the elderly. The, elderly is mean, the elderly immune system is is senescent, it's not as good as it is when you're an adult, and babies just don't have an, anti, uh, 
a, an immune response when the maternal um, antibody wanes in these newborns, they're very susceptible to getting RSV. And there's a huge amount of work. We don't have a vaccine for RSV. We have some monoclonal antibodies for RSV. But what we know about RSV, a huge amount of work has been done on the surface protein of RSV, which is called a fusion uh, protein. And similar to spike, this protein is involved in binding the virus to the cell. And on the virus, generally, it is this pre-fusion type structure. Whereas after it, once it's triggered, it is very, like a spring mechanism, the, this kind of inside here will trigger out and bind onto the cell and pull the two cells, uh, pull the cell and the virus together. What happens in this triggering between the pre-fusion and the post-fusion is that you lose a lot of these recognition sites, what we call epitopes. So antibodies that may be neutralizing here will not recognize this, this post-fusion confirmation. And the post, there's been a huge amount of effort at making an RSV vaccine for years and years and they've always failed. And really this kind of understanding that going that there are two forms and two structures of this fusion protein really has changed our, 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 the way that we look at, at RSV. We will all go around and I've done this, I've done too many ELISAs to look at fusion protein and we have every one of us have really high titers, antibody titers against the post-fusion form. But finding antibodies, we do have neutralizing antibodies to pre-fusion but they will be a smaller amount. They're there, they can be potent. But really, if we're making a vaccine to RSV, we really need to start thinking about making a vaccine using this pre-fusion form. The downside of, 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 of the pre to post-fusion form is that the post-fusion is much more ther thermodynamically stable. So this protein, amino acid sequence, prefers to be in this form compared to the pre-fusion. So to make it more stabilized, there are mutations that have been incorporated into, into uh, the F protein of RSV to keep it in this pre-fusion form. So now in this 3D structure, and structure is hugely important for the immune system to, to recognize, especially antibodies, um, by immunizing with this um, stabilized mutated pre-fusion that stays in this format, the idea is now that the immune system will see only this pre-fusion form and you'll get more neutralizing antibodies against, against fusion. And this is a, a kind of concept, the structural immunology concept is being used for other uh, uh, viruses as well and used for SARS-CoV-2. So this has been used with Moderna's vaccine, NIH have, have pioneered this and now it's in this mRNA vaccine, uh, um, uh, vaccine that's being tried in, in the US. Okay, so moving away from immunology and virology, what do we need to do when we're making a vaccine, uh, uh, a pandemic vaccine? Well, first of all, we have to think about, well, what do, can we predict what um, uh, viruses are going to come and cause pandemics or cause uh, quite a lot of disruption or epidemics? And WHO have defined a set of diseases, crimean uh, convohemorrhagic uh, fever, Nipah, Lassa, Ebola, and others like NIAID and the UK Vaccines Network have added to those as well. So we have an idea, and then also there's disease X, there's disease you can't possibly plan for, but you need to put everything else in place and then have those platforms ready so that you can, um, you can very quickly plug and play disease X into all of the other technologies. And here are years of practice to become an overnight success. There's a huge amount we have, and I'll show you this in a, in a while, very quickly developed uh, um, vaccines for SARS-CoV-2, but it comes on the back of years of research of getting ready to for a pandemic. So there's been a lot of developments about making vaccines very fast and being able to take the new disease and put it into what we know already. And this was something that we kind of failed on with, with um, influenza virus uh, in 2009. But we've got to quickly prove the safety and efficacy of those vaccines in clinical trial. And that, as we can see, is hugely accelerated uh, for SARS-CoV-2. But we still have a few gaps that we need to, that we definitely need to address for the next uh, pandemic. Once you have proved the safety and efficacy as quickly as possible, now you're licensed. Now you need to deploy it to um, to uh, everybody. You need to be able to mass manufacture it. So it doesn't matter if you can make it quickly. If you can't manufacture it quickly, it's no good to anybody. There's been a huge amount of work done in the regulatory environment about pre-registering vaccines. This was this came through quite well in with the 2009 influenza pandemic, where there was mock-up 
uh, licensure documents for registering flu vaccines. And again, we thought that the, the next flu pandemic would be a H5N1 coming out of Southeast Asia. And so everything was ready. All the registration documents were ready to go with a H5N1. So they could be quickly changed for the H1N1 that actually did happen. Ease of deployment and administration, I'll come back to in a few minutes, and stockpiling. If it's going to happen, you should be able to keep that vaccine on the shelf for, for a long time after that and not have to keep manufacturing it fresh every time. And we, I mentioned the few failures that we had with the H1N1 uh, pandemic in 2009. We also didn't do so well in the Ebola uh, outbreak in West Africa in 2014. We did okay, we got there in the end. What you can see here is this is the, um, the number of cases across three countries in, in West Africa, and you can see the number of cases rising. And clinical trials only started towards, well, CDC clinical trials only started towards the end of, of, the, of the epidemic there. And again, a lot of vaccines were being scaled up and getting ready for, for trial for Ebola in West Africa. But by the time they were ready to test, um, the, the epidemic was over. So we learned a lot from that as well. We've got to be ready, got to, got to be, get in there fast, get the vaccines trialed and, and get them licensed. From that um, uh, 2014 outbreak, uh, Merck did license an Ebola virus vaccine. It was a really uh, successful vaccine trial. They showed very nice efficacy. And in the latest uh, Ebola outbreak in um, DRC, uh, Janssen and um, Very Nordic have now managed to license their vaccine as well as, as a combination. What we can see with SARS-CoV-2 is the University of Oxford's timeline. You can see from the genetic sequence being available in early January, it took 104 days, which is an incredibly short amount of time, to get it, the, uh, a vaccine designed, to get the first batch manufactured, uh, GMP ready to go into clinical trial, to get into, into uh, humans. Moderna in the US uh, were in clinical trial in 60 days, but you know, it's, it's um, again, it's an incredibly short amount of time to, to get into your phase one trial. What's also really supported uh, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine uh, development is this organization called CEPI, the Coalition of Epidemic uh, Preparedness and Innovation. And before, if you look back on some of these documents now and you think, oh, how naive we all were, but they were really, this was set up by the G7, um, and really they did a lot of work on figuring out what was going to be the cost of a pandemic. And here you can see that it would cost 2.8 billion, billion to uh, progress one vaccine um, to, to licensing. And they estimated that it would cost 570 billion that would be the cost of, of, the, um, of the pandemic. And clearly this is a complete underestimate from what we've seen with SARS-CoV-2 where we're into the, the billions of trillions at this stage worldwide. So looking at vaccines, um, so what, how can you make different vaccines? What's the best vaccine that you can make? One option is to start with the coronavirus, the SARS-CoV-2, and grow it up and inactivate it. And this strategy is very, very conventional. It is the most conventional way of making a vaccine. It's very successful for veterinary vaccines. It's even successful for some uh, human vaccines, such as the original whooping cough vaccine, and also inactivated polio vaccine. The downside of this vaccine strategy is, that, is, bio, is the biosecurity that's needed around um, these kind of vaccine manufacturing facilities. Does anybody really want to live next door to a coronavirus uh, inactivated vaccine manufacturing facility without knowing that none of that coronavirus is going to escape into, into Cork Harbour? So it's, and also from an immune perspective, uh, you don't get CD8 killer T cells and sometimes some inactivated vaccines um, can be very, uh, poorly potent. Not all of them, but some of them can be. The next strategy is to mutate it, to make it, so to make an attenuated vaccine. This was very successful, say for example, with oral polio vaccine. The, the risk of this is that you've got to make sure that you've, you've included enough mutations so that your, your virus doesn't revert back to being virulent, and that can happen with uh, some vaccines, uh, sometimes oral polio vaccine being one guilty party. The next one is kind of seen as kind of the safest strategy in the sense that you take a subunit, it's a subunit vaccine where you uh, recombinantly express proteins, you purify them, but you need to add an adjuvant to it. You need to modulate, you need to tickle the immune response to kick it up in the right response that you need to induce protection against uh, infection. 
These are the new kids, well, the RNA is the new kids in the block, DNA, these are nucleic acids, whereby you take nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA, that expresses spike or nucleic acid or whatever protein you're interested in, and uh, inject that into the body and uh, uh, generate a, an immune response, or use uh, recombinant virus vectors, whereby you take, and I'll show you this in a second, adenovirus, uh, to express your spike or your nucleic acid, inject that into the body, into the body and, um, and uh, hopefully induce protection. So this is one of our kind of favorite uh, virus platforms that we like to work with, which is adenovirus. It's replication incompetent, so it can infect into a cell, but it can't infect other cells. And it's genetically modified, so that it's replication incompetent, and it expresses the SARS-CoV-2 antigens that you're interested in. It's a, huge, it's a really, really immunogenic uh, vaccine vector. So you get very high antibody in, and sometimes T cells from, for, for your vaccine antigen. The downside of it is that you also get antibody uh, responses against the adenovirus proteins themselves, which then means that it does pretty much prevent you from reusing, from reinjecting that adenovirus over and over again. You can give it mucosally that I'll show you and you can repeatedly give it mucosally but injecting it, you will induce a strong antibody response against your, your fiber and your hexon proteins on your, on your adenovirus. So to avoid that, what uh, a lot of people are doing is using alternative um, uh, types of adenovirus. So Oxford are using this CHADOX1, chimpanzee adeno Oxford 1. Janssen are using AD26, um, and this will avoid the pre-existing AD immunity that we all have, because we've all been infected with AD along as, as we've grown up. Um, but there is still going to be uh, an issue of reusing these particular virus vectors again and again. Um, so in the, there's a huge race, as I'm sure you're all aware, for, um, for coronavirus vaccines, we have nucleic acids, adenoviruses, and subunit vaccines, and I won't go into that in, in, in too much detail, we can talk about that. Some of the questions that are, that are technically questions that we're spending time thinking about is, what's the best... Um, sequence for an antigen for here is spike this is what Janssen are using they, they looked at a lot of different types uh, Vaxart that we're working with looked at a, a few different types and really what's mean, most immunogenic and there may actually be differences whether you're using a genetic approach such as an adenovirus or using a subunit approach such as um, uh, Novavax or, or other companies Vaccine access is something that we're really interested in in, um, in my lab and it really is about stabilizing the vaccine out of cold chains so that it's more that it's easier to distribute and also to avoid needles and syringes and avoid uh, biohazardous waste. And it is a big issue with um, immunization programs, this whole idea of cold chain, you have to keep all your vaccines cold or frozen. And this can double the cost of, of vaccination, especially in low middle income countries, and you have increased vaccine wastage. So one way that we're addressing that in Cork and UCC is to develop these microneedle patches, which will just be a skin based uh, patch. And we do this uh, using microneedles, which are these little protrusions here that on, on adhesive tape. And these little uh, coloured -y things here, these little spikes, uh, incorporate the vaccine, they're made of sugar they're, and they stabilize the vaccine out of, out of cold chain. Uh, you put them in the skin as, and as you can see here, uh, they very quickly uh, dissolve in the skin and deliver the back vaccine into the body. We've looked at this with uh, dissolvable microneedles, uh, patches for multiple different vaccine types in multiple different animal models and we see very nice uh, immune responses. And the second technology that we're looking at for, particularly for SARS-CoV-2 vaccine, is working with this company in San Francisco called Vaxart, who also use adenovirus, and they have an adjuvant co-expressed in their, in their adenovirus as well. And the really neat thing about that is that they tablet their vaccine and enteric coat it, give it orally, it dissolves in the intestinal space. And what's really nice there is that you get a mucosal immune response. So all of, the vaccine, all of the other vaccines that are in clinical trial at the moment for SARS-CoV-2 are injected. And from a distribution, from a logistics issue, from an ease of administration, in, if it works, it's great. Yeah, and if you get protection, that's fantastic. And it is a first line, let's get something out there that works. But really, um, you're not going to get a mucosal immune response and you're not going to get protection at the upper airways. And we've seen this in the macaque studies that have been 
published with the vaccines, uh, with the, the Pfizer vaccine, the Janssen vaccine, the Oxford vaccine, you don't get mucosal immune responses because they're injected. It doesn't mean that they're, they're not going to work, but it does mean that you're going to get a systemic uh, protective response. So we know from, um, from, I was doing a spatical with Vaxart a, a few years ago and worked on RSV, and you can show that in cotton rats that uh, if you give the vaccine an adenovirus express infusion coating intranasally or interestingly by oral administration, you completely eliminate uh, the, you pre prevent uh, RSV from growing and uh, in, the, in those cotton rats, rats and those vaccinated cotton rats. I won't go through that just to show that you get uh, mucosal immunity in cotton rats. And also you can see this is that our, our challenge, our, our lab-based uh, controlled human challenge, and this is with influenza. And Vaxart did a nice study with their influenza vaccine, adenovirus expressing influenza proteins, and showed that they got uh, uh, equivalent efficacy to what you get with the injected vaccine. So that does give us some hope that um, you are going to get protection uh, against, uh, it, hopefully, with uh, SARS-CoV-2 by just changing the antigen from influenza to, um, to uh, SARS-CoV-2. Towards the end, I just want to talk a little bit about how, how things have changed enormously for making a vaccine. This is our bog standard way of making a vaccine. You have your preclinical, you go through maybe a few cycles, you then apply for regulatory approval to do your phase one clinical trial. Your phase one, your primary endpoint is always going to be safety. You're going to, uh, but you're going to look at immunity as well, take some blood and see if you get the response that you want. And very often you can cycle through that, but at each stage you're waiting to some extent to see the results and to build up towards the next phase. And very often you'll go through several cycles of phase one before you move on to phase two, which is a few hundred people or maybe it's a few thousand people to see if you get much, if you get immunity and potentially do you get some sort of efficacy within the community. And then if that looks promising, then you look for the big bucks and you, have, you try and implore the, 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 the funders to give you enough money to do a phase three clinical trial, which generally is in 15,000 uh, or more adults and, and children generally, because most of your vaccines are going to be pediatric. What's happened with SARS-CoV-2 is that that has all been, um, it's all been done in parallel. The trials will still take the time that they need because we need to look at the safety signals. You can't uh, accelerate that. It is all still to the regulatory standards, but they're going in parallel and also manufacturing is going in parallel. So there's a huge amount of risk being taken and a lot of funding being put in to manufacture huge amounts of vaccines that if they fail in phase three, they'll be no good to anybody. But it's a risk that has been decided that it's worth taking because um, we need a, a time is the main priority here is to get a vaccine. We don't want to have to wait a year before we start manufacturing to get some of it out into, into the environment. So we've, we've shrunk the timeline from 10 to 15 years to about 10 months. And uh, in the US, there's Operation Warp Speed has put billions of dollars into, into this as, as the UK government and, and the EU as well. And then once one is, is, uh, is licensed, there will be a lot of follow-up post-marketing surveillance there, um, the, to, to make sure that um, the vaccine is showing efficacy and it is uh, safe. One of the key balances that we always have to make with a, a vaccine is the balance between efficacy and, uh, efficacy and safety. And we know from the phase one studies that have been published of Pfizer's, of Janssen's, of, um, well not Janssen, but of Oxford and Janssen and Moderna, that there, there are re reactogenic effects seen in a higher number of people. Um, we get great antibodies and uh, get good T cell responses, some better than others. Uh, the safety profile, they're using all of these pandemic vaccines are using a really high dose, especially, uh, well, they, they are all, all of those different strategies are using high doses. Um, and that is going to push up your reactogen reactogenicity profile, which we are seeing. Um, and um, so it, it, my concern would be that a lot of people, once they're immunized with this, are going to say, oh, I got a headache, oh, I had fatigue for, for 24 hours. It, it, the second immunization is less than the first, but it does happen. Phase three studies are ongoing. The FDA has said that there has to be at least 50% um, efficacy seen, which is a very low bar for a vaccine, but again, it's pandemic. There's a lot of goalposts that are in different places to normal. 
and they have to show that it's a lab confirmed COVID or SARS-CoV-2 infection. And the FDA is presuming that um, the vaccine will be more efficacious at preventing severe disease compared to infection. And this again kind of comes back to the idea of these vaccines inducing very, very good systemic and lower respiratory responses rather than, than upper respiratory responses. So we have to wait and see. So finally, I just want to kind of, you know, it, that there is a lot of hope that we will have a vaccine, but also to kind of to remind you that we have been here before. We were here with polio back, well, I wasn't, even I wasn't around in the 50s, but the, we have been here with epidemics and this massive rush for a vaccine and a vaccine working and a vaccine eradication disease. So there was a polio epidemic globally uh, in the early 50s, but in Cork in particular in 1956, there was a bad outbreak. If you look at newspaper reports, and Dr. Andrew McCarthy in the School of History has done a lot of work on this, um, to the point where there was a lot of, similar to what we see now with SARS-CoV-2, um, and also to the point where they, they still allowed the GA to happen, um, but they didn't want Cork people going up to the final in Croke Park, um, which in hindsight, people before would probably have said that, oh, that's terrible, but now I think anybody would be glad for uh, any sport to be, to be going on. And this race for polio virus vaccine, um, is a really fascinating uh, uh, historical event, both scientifically, historically, socially. There was a massive um, uh, re uh, drive to raise funding. It's called a March of Dimes in the US. First vaccine that was licensed was the inactivated salt vaccine, which works. It's very high uh, efficacy. It was the first one licensed. There was a bad instance whereby the vaccine was not inactivated fully and they actually injected live polio into, into some children, giving them obviously polio disease and, and paralyzing them. Uh, Albert Sabin then came up with the oral attenuated vaccine. And again, this kind of raises this kind of idea of inactivate, injective versus oral, systemic versus mucosal immunity. And uh, we now, the oral polio vaccine was a really, really good vaccine for years and years. It is one of it we've almost eradicated uh, polio from the planet we've almost eradicated for a good few years but we've now got africa free of, of polio virus you can see here really clear advantages of oral polio vaccine it's easy to administer it's as unstable as as, as it doesn't have much thermal stability as as the injected it's easy to administer you don't need highly trained workforce to to do it highly efficacious you get that mucosal immunity um and it's attenuated manufacturing. You don't need that high biosecurity levels compared to an activated vaccine. Downside of it is that you can get cases of um, virus-associated um, uh, paralytic polio, which is why the whole OPV is being withdrawn now and we're moving completely over to IPV, which is injected. It's very, very efficacious. Um, you get systemic immunity, but you don't get mucosal immunity, but that's fine. If there isn't polio in the environment, that's okay. Um, you need to be, so you don't protect, you don't prevent transmission, but if there isn't transmission around anyway, that's okay. But as long as there is a single case of, of polio in the world, we are st all still at risk of getting polio virus. And it's exactly the same with SARS-CoV-2. There's a lot of parallels between polio and, and SARS-CoV-2. And then finally, just one note to, to, to mention on public confidence. It's hugely, this is another area that I collaborate with um, Dr. Fleming on and Dr. Sam in the School of Pharmacy is vaccine uptake and vaccine hesitancy and vaccine confidence. And I, I won't go into this in too much detail, but we're at this stage now where high level disease, everybody's screening for a vaccine. As soon as a vaccine works and the disease goes down, people will wonder why you need to keep vaccinating. And we will see an outbreak again if we haven't eradicated uh, SARS-CoV-2 from, from the planet. So on that note, um, I'll stop and um, uh, just as conclusions and as headline kind of messages to take away, hugely rapid development of SARS-CoV-2. There's, there's a lot we still don't know about SARS-CoV-2 from infection perspective and from the, the uh, immunity perspective and from the vaccine perspective. There's a lot we're learning each day and the acceleration of, of, of the development of vaccines and the amount of resources that have been put into it means that we will have an answer late this year for at least one of those vaccines. We should know by November have a preliminary look at Pfizer's vaccine and then further on late 2020, early 2021. We then really need to think about uh, equitable deployment of those vaccines. We have to avoid vaccine nationalism. And then once that's 
kind of once we're all happy that we're not worried having to go into work and with masks and social distancing, we really need to think about the best generation of vaccines. If the first one is only okay, but it will do, we really need to come up with a good vaccine that will eradicate it uh, from the planet. And we, keep, we need to keep preparing for the next pandemic because there will be one. So on that note, I'd like to thank you for your attention and I look forward to discussing this in, in more detail with you. Thank you so much, Dr. Moore.